Today we're gonna wrap up a series that we've been calling Easter People and what we've been doing over the past um, number of weeks is, is looking at people from the scriptures, um, real people who experienced the resurrection and then the effect that that had on not just their life but their entire destiny. And we've seen week after week of how um, people experienced the Holy Spirit and experienced the power of Jesus coming back to life and how that literally changed the entire direction of their life. And so today we're gonna wrap that up by talking about us, about the church. There's a question that I've been getting asked on a regular basis. Um, it's almost nonstop over the last two and a half years and it, it happens here at church, it happens when I run into somebody at Weigel's, which by the way, I think I could write an entire book on evangelism through Weigel's. Um, <laughs> It's incredible the number of conversations I get into while we're standing in line, and I'm not a conversation dude, if you know me. Um, well, it doesn't matter where I am. People always ask, is the church doing okay, right? Like that would be a normal question to be asked, especially if you're on my side of the fence and you're leading a group of people who are trying to live out their faith in Jesus. And so I get asked that question all the time, but I never know how to answer it. Like, how do you answer a question like that? Is the church doing okay? Is it doing okay if people are showing up? Because people are showing up again. Is the church doing okay if you provide study opportunities where people are actually growing in their faith? Is it, is it doing okay if we're able to make our budget? Is it doing okay when we compare ourselves to other churches? I don't really know how to answer a question like that. It's, a, it's an odd question, but I have been thinking a lot about it. And it's led me to an even more, I think, poignant and at least for me, sobering question, which is, is, is it even okay for the church to be doing okay? See, this is important because I don't think okay is what God had in mind when he poured out his spirit on a ragtag band of broken and frightened and somewhat demoralized, often sin-prone people as they met hiding in a room trying to figure out, well, what are we gonna do next, right? Because unlike us, they were there in that moment. They had given everything they had to follow this guy, Jesus, and they were there when he was nailed to a cross and they watched him suffocate to death and then they saw his body being placed in a tomb. And so I don't know that that, that moment, I'm not sure I could overcome that. But I don't think that's what God had in mind when they were watching that happen. I don't think that's what God had in mind when he infused them with his presence and his power and he gave them his grace and he poured out his mercy on them. And then he gave them the ultimate calling, which is now you get to go be witnesses, right? And you get to testify to everything that you have seen that this one who had come and taught us how to live, laid down his life for the sins of all of humanity, and he did not just die, but he came back to life again. And he told them that you would be the witnesses to the good news of Jesus in your little community and around the entire region, and believe it or not, even around to the ends of the earth. I'm not sure that's what God had in mind when he gave the expectation I don't think God intended them to turn right around and build a building and then just be satisfied with getting by. See, I think his spirit came down like fire. If you got here early enough this morning, you may have heard that scripture being read, which by the way, all of those voices were people in our church. I mean, we're a diverse bunch of people that come from a lot of different places. I think the spirit came down fire, like fire so that a revolution would be born. So that people who thought they did not have much power would get a new infusion of power. So that they would see themselves as nothing less than actual freedom fighters through whom God would end up turning the entire world upside down. I mean, it had to be an incredible moment. They were locked in a room and then all of a sudden, God pours out his Holy Spirit and what seemed like to everybody else, total chaos, I mean, they even had to stand up and say they're not drunk. It's just nine o'clock in the morning, right? Like, if it's four or five, I get it. But it's nine o'clock in the morning. These people are not drunk. Something significant is happening. And with that, the church got launched. And in Acts chapter two, 
Beginning in verse 34, we get an insight of what that first church looked like. Luke says, a deep sense of awe came over them all, which let me just stop right there and ask you a question. When's the last time that happened to you? Like when you came together and you were just completely overwhelmed by God's spirit, or you heard a song and it just absolutely broke your heart, or you're just sitting there, right? And, and maybe you didn't see it coming. Maybe you've been rehearsing everything going on in your life over the last week and you just suddenly out of nowhere got flooded with God's goodness and God's grace and you started to just become aware of God's mercy in your life. I mean, that's what awe is. They didn't show up to be wowed. They showed up and they got ambushed by God's spirit. A deep sense of awe came over them all and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together constantly and shared everything that they had. They sold their possessions and shared the proceeds with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their group those who are being saved. It's a staggering moment in human history. That does not sound like a church that is just doing okay. And when I read that text, I see several things that we gotta kinda pay attention to. And the first is, that early church, they were radically devoted to God. The apostles spoke with power. They didn't water anything down. They didn't worry about being politically correct. They just broke open God's word, and as a result of that, miraculous things started to happen. In other words, truth was held at the very highest premium possible. Now, would you not agree that truth is in high demand in our day? In fact, the more the years roll by, the harder it is to figure out what is true and what's not true. I mean, you and I live in a culture right now that is inundated by conspiracy theories. And it gets exacerbated by algorithms and social media that fuel our divide and push us into our silos. And it just becomes easier and easier to buy into whatever we're seeing on Facebook, right? That's how people end up believing that an election was stolen or that um, JFK Jr. is really alive or that we did not walk on the moon or that the earth is, is not round or that birds really aren't real, right? None of that is true. It is completely fiction and made up. The election wasn't stolen. JFK Jr. is dead. We did walk on the moon. The earth is round and birds are real. They're not government drones that are spying on us. It is amazing what we will buy into and assume it is truth. And it's not just people in our culture, it is people in our church. I cannot tell you the number of times I've had conversations over the last two and a half years with people trying to get them to see that what they are selling their soul to, it is a made up, fictitious lie. So how do you find the truth? <laughs> Y'all ain't ready for this, but I'm gonna drop some Wesley theology on you. One of the reasons I like being United Methodist and what drew me into United Methodism is because of our name, right? Methodist, we, we are methodical about what we do. There's an intentionality about our faith and how we live that out. Wesley lived in an era where he knew that people were struggling with the truth, and so he came up with what's called Wesley's Quadrilateral. This is way more information about our tribe than you wanna know, I know. But he had a quadrilateral, and so what he did is he said, there's scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, right? Scripture is what we base everything on. It's like the foundation. So if you wanna interpret life, or if you wanna figure out who God is or what your role is as you're trying to follow Jesus, scripture is your primary source. If you still don't get the answers, then you look at tradition. Well, what have Christians done since the early church? I mean, what's been the general belief and the practice? I mean, how did they live out their faith? So you take scripture and you add to it tradition. Then you go to reason, right? God gave us a brain. We are not a church where we ask you to check your brain at the door. 
God gave us a brain. It may be the greatest gift that he ever gave human beings. He gave us the ability to think. And so Wesley said, you take scripture, you look at 2,000 years of history, and then you ask yourself, was well, that actually reasonable? And then when it's all said and done, you go to your own experience. What does life tell me about what I'm facing? Now, that does not give us every single answer, but what it does do is give us a framework to begin to learn how do we navigate our way through life? How do we start to figure out what is true? Right, does that make sense? It's very simple. You can apply that not only in your relationship with God, but you can apply that to virtually any issue that you face in life. What does the scripture say? What does history tell me? Is it reasonable? And what has been my experience? See, the point is, <coughs> our devotion to Jesus must be greater than our devotion to our own personal ideology. God is not interested in just making your top 10 list or my top 10 list. It's not like God just wants to have sort of this cursory influence over our lives. The scriptures teach us that Jesus is both Savior and Lord, meaning that Jesus saves us from our sin, frees us from being held down by our sin, but also wants to be Lord of our life. So he's not interested in being in the top 10. He wants a, to, us to place him number one so that he can then influence everything that happens in our life. And I know we're sitting in church and we're all supposed to go, yeah, that's exactly what God wants. But listen, I can be honest enough to tell you that that is a constant battle in my own life and I suspect it is in yours too. It is hard to let Jesus be Lord of our lives. And yet that's what they did. The second thing I see is that they were irrationally devoted to God. They were, they were irrationally devoted to each other. Luke says there was no need among them. Imagine that. Like if one person suffered, then everybody in the community suffered. If someone had a need, they did whatever they had to do. They would sell whatever they had to sell to try to meet that need. So what they're teaching us is that living in community is a really big deal. And we know that now, having been isolated from one another for so long. I can still remember that first day when we got to get back together as a church. I mean, it was unbelievable just to get to see human beings who are pulling in the same direction, come face to face. Community is a big deal. They took care of each other. They looked out for each other. They kept the best interest of the community as their highest priority because they shared a common vision, which is the third thing. This one, <laughs> this one blows me away. The scriptures say, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill, watch this, of all the people, enjoying the goodwill of all the people. I grew up in church, y'all. I've never experienced that right there. And I know a lot of us, we've been through church splits, you've been through, you know, whatever deacon getting mad at whoever and miss so-and-so, gossiped about something. Somebody was always mad in church. And yet when it started, they enjoyed the goodwill of all the people. The operative word there is all. Now, it's not that they didn't have differences of opinion, and it's not that they were just mindless drones who did exactly what they were told to do, but they understood that the community was not about them, right? They understood that the church did not exist to just simply pacify every person's needs or wants or desires. Somehow, they managed to stay focused on the task at hand which was to stand witness to the power of God through the resurrection of Jesus. Which is why I would argue our diversity as a community of faith, it is our greatest strength. We got people who come from all walks of life hanging out around this place. We got people that have been to prison. We got people that are battling addiction. We got people who've got a lot of money and we got people who are currently unhoused. We got people that have got great families. We got people whose background is completely jacked up. We got people that vote Republican. We got people that vote Democrat. We got people that are independent and don't really care about either party. We got people who are straight. And yes, we got people in this church who are gay. All of us though, we are united together because we're doing our best to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That's our vision that the world can change. 
And so make no mistake about it, y'all. I don't want to be a part of a church where we all think and vote and live in the exact same way, man. Our diversity is our strength because it says to the world, they will accept anybody down there. And you may think, well, that's what the church does. No, it does not. No, it does not. There are thousands of churches where if you don't look and believe exactly the way they look, they're gonna be friendly to each other, but they will not be friendly to you. And the reason I know that is because I grew up in those kinds of churches. So they had this common vision. But then Luke says they were also relentless in their pursuit of service. I like that. They were involved, right? They didn't just sit back and hope that somebody else takes care of things. Like, they were all in. They didn't leave any chips on the table. They bet the farm in the reality of the resurrection, and they threw themselves into the work for the sake of God's vision and for the sake of the community. And Luke says, because they did all of these things, the payoff was unbelievable. He says this in verse 47, and each day the Lord added to their numbers those who are being saved. When I read this, I cannot help but think, I don't want to be okay with just being okay. And I just feel this sense of urgency to make sure that we're doing everything that God asks us to do. You and I live in a world, you know this, where people feel a lot of urgency about a lot of things, especially about our careers. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to this guy about his job, and he told me this. He said, publicly, we talk a lot about service and excellence and quality. And all of that stuff is true. We really believe in it. But privately, he said, the reality of every mor- uh, is every morning we wake up, and the question we'd really be thinking is, how can we put t- our competition out of business? He went on to say, we would never say that publicly, but every morning we would say, how can we outthink, outstrategize, outperform our rivals so overwhelmingly that it will be psychologically demoralizing, emotionally defeating, and organizationally obliterated? Now that's, that's the way to look at your job right there, right? He's telling me this, and I'm just like, wow, that's ruthless. But then I've been thinking about it. Who is our competition? You ever think about that? I think we get confused about this sometimes. The natural tendency, especially here in the South, when there's a church literally on every corner, is to think, well, our competition's other churches. (coughs) And that's just not true. Every church who's following in the footsteps of Jesus, they are not our enemy, they are our partner and our ally. And I thank God for the church because there's nothing else like the church on the planet when it's functioning the way that God needs it to function. I can honestly say I thank God for Cokesbury Church. I thank God for Faith Promise Church. I thank God for Hardin Valley Church of Christ and for Cedar Springs and for Providence. I thank God for Lutherans and Episcopalians and Quakers and Congregationalists and non-denominationalists. I thank God for Pentecostals. Somebody's got to get fired up when they go to church. And listen, I grew up Baptist. A lot of you guys that have been around here, you know that. I didn't become a Methodist until I started dating a Methodist girl. Do you know that there are over 100 kinds of Baptists? There are Northern Baptists and Southern Baptists. There's American Baptists and General Baptists. There's Particular Baptists. There's even one bunch that I'm not making this up. There's a whole denomination called the Two Seed in the Spirit Predestinarian Baptists. Now, I don't even know what that means, but I thank God that they're around if they're trying to help up there become a reality down here. See, Jesus, our founder and our leader, he defined very clearly our competition for us. One time he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? It's the most important question that a human being can be asked. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was revealed to you by human beings. 
but by my father, not by human beings, but by my father in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church, here it is, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's the competition. The church just has one singular gift to offer the world and it's Jesus, that's it. Not power, it's not money, it's not a political agenda, it's just this one guy, Jesus. It's his life, his story, the words that he spoke, everything that he taught, his death on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins, his resurrection for the hope of our eternity, his body and his spirit. Jesus is it. And I just need to remind us that this is a Jesus church. Make no mistake about it. People ask me all the time, are you a liberal church or are you a conservative church? I never answer that question because we ain't either of those. We are a Jesus church. This was a Jesus church. Listen, this was, I promise you, I'm gonna mess around and preach till everybody starts clapping. This was a Jesus church way before you and I got here and by God's grace, it will be a Jesus church long after you and I are dead and buried. And Jesus says that he's building his church and here's the deal, so that the gates of hell will not prevail. And some of y'all are thinking, he's already said hell twice in church, I'm about to say a lot more. In other words, our competition is hell itself. <laughs> this is kind of interesting imagery that, that he uses right here. And we get this kind of weird, messed up picture, right? So many times we think of the church as sort of being huddled up and being afraid of hell. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. You gotta be the ones that go out and stand against the gates of hell. Like, you're the ones that gotta keep it from prevailing. See, the image of the church taking on hell and battering down the gates, that's our competition. And the work of hell is wherever the will of God is not. That's where hell is prevailing. Now you look at the Knoxville area. Every time a little child feels unwanted or unloved or uncared for or grows up where they have no dream for themselves or doesn't think it's even worth finishing their education, that's hell prevailing in our community. Every time a marriage that began with two people making a promise as they looked into each other's eyes, when that marriage ends or it crashes and it burns, that's hell actually prevailing. That's not the way that God said it was supposed to be. Every time there are racial differences that divide a street, a neighborhood, a city, a church, or an entire community, and there is then this kind of distrust or suspicion or oppression, that's hell, hell actually prevailing. Every time money gets idolized or worshiped or it gets used to allow someone to determine their self-worth by it. Or um, somebody's security or somebody's dream. It all depends on how much money they have. That is hell prevailing. Every time a lie is told and truth gets trampled on, that's hell prevailing. Every time an entire generation of people becomes separated and isolated, that is hell prevailing. Every time a workplace becomes dehumanizing or fear-based instead of releasing the potential of the image of God in every human being, that is hell prevailing. See, when families are broken up or when virtue gets torn apart or when sinful habits create a life of hidden shame, when faith gets undermined and lost and when hope gets trampled on and when people get trashed, that is hell prevailing and it is not acceptable to Jesus that hell prevails. It is not okay. See, our job, friends, is not to meet a budget, and it's not to run a program, and it's not to try to fill a building, and it's not to maintain the status quo, and it's not to keep perpetuating the traditions that we all grew up with. Our job is nothing short of doing what we can to put hell out of business. That's what the church was created for. And the And I'm just shooting you as straight as I possibly can. I believe that that right there, that is why Jesus went through the cross on Friday, and that's why he laid on the, in the tomb on Saturday, and that is why he was raised from the dead on Sunday. And it's why we proclaim Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom 
so that we may present ourselves mature, redeemed, complete, whole, healed in Christ. But you gotta understand, it's not a collective vision by itself. It's a vision that involves you and involves me. Jesus put it this way. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then, like it's just sort of leaking out of you, let that love pour out onto the people in your house. And then let that love begin to pour out into the people in your neighborhood and in in your school and where you work. And when you hang out with people watching baseball, they're gonna win the whole thing today, I promise you that. You just sort of, you let love begin to ooze out of your soul. and, And sometimes that's hard to do, right? Because we talk about it all the time. There are some people in this world that are very, very hard to love. And the second you make yourself committed that I'm gonna love people, that's the exact moment that God brings them into your life. But yet that's the idea, is that you abide with God in such a way that you become a little Jesus-powered agent of the kingdom. So that when the powers of hell (laughs) see you coming, They think to themselves, oh man, we're in trouble today. This is not somebody that we're gonna have influence over. Now, they've been been hanging out down at Cokesbury Church and they're serious about this thing. When they see you coming, they need to start shaking in their shoes a little bit. See, that's the deal. (laughs) And so when I was asked, is the church doing okay? I realized, I don't wanna be okay with doing okay. We talk about this a lot. The, the clock in my life and your life, it is constantly ticking. And one day it's gonna tick one final time and then our life on this planet is gonna be over. And the older I get, the more I realize I don't wanna just do okay. See, it is true. You can spend your life trying to make a point and a lot of people do that or you can spend your life trying to make a difference. You can seldom do both at the same time. And I would argue that what our world needs, they don't need any more points being made. But I think our world is desperate for people who are willing to make a difference. But either way, that clock in your life and my life, it is relentlessly ticking. And at the expense of maybe being grandiose, I believe that this day right here is the most important day of your life and my life because it's the only day we got. Yesterday's long gone. Tomorrow's not yet here. And so if you and I are gonna make a difference, it's gotta be this day. There are a lot of people when you read through scripture who had their day and they stepped up. Moses had a day, Joshua had a day, Saul had his day, Samson had his day, Esther had her day, Peter had his day, the Apostle Paul had his day, everybody gets a day. And friends, this is your day. What are you planning on doing with with your day? See, I believe that God in Jesus is doing something right now. That's why Paul says, be very careful then how you live, because sometimes we can get really careless about that. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Friends, I want to be a part of a community of people who say, you know what, we're gonna give everything we have to realize the redemptive power of God that he set before us. I want to be a servant and a brother and a fellow soldier in an army of spirit-breathed compassion that is rolling back the tide of secularism in our society. I want us to continue to be the kind of place where people who are desperate for grace, they can walk in even if they're scared to death and they won't have a finger pointed at them, but they'll experience grace. 
I want them to know that they are more than just their past, that they're not defined by their current circumstance. I want our city to find unity. I'm tired of all the anger and the division. I want hope to abound in every corner of the city of Knoxville. I want each of us to find our God-given purpose, and I want us to continue to sink our roots in so deep that if we decided next Sunday that we're just gonna call it quits and we're gonna pack this joint up and go somewhere else, I want the entire city to absolutely freak out because Cokesbury Church no longer exists. I want our roots so deep in our community that people know there is a respite in this world where they can come if they're hungry or if they're tired or if they're thirsty or if they've been in prison or they got no clothes on their back. I want them to know that there's a place where they can come and they can experience, if nothing else, they can find grace. And maybe it's their second chance or their 455th chance or their 6,000th chance that everybody that walks through the doors of Cokesbury Church knows that they're among a group of people who are going through the exact same thing they're going through, but yet they stay so focused on the cross and the power of the resurrection that hell itself begins to shake in its boots. That, friends, is what the church is supposed to be about. And listen, this is an awesome place if you're new. We are doing so much of what God wants us to do, but I don't want us to grow comfortable because I'm telling you guys, you see it everywhere. The last two and a half years has wrecked our society. And yeah, it feels like everything's back to normal, but pay attention this week to the number of people that you interact with that do not smile. They don't engage in conversation like they used to engage. Notice the number of people that just, they're staring at their phone and it just looks like they're aimlessly walking through life. I don't know of a greater time in my lifetime for God's spirit to move in our community than right now. And I think that our best days as a church are still in front of us. They are not behind us, but it takes all of us pulling together. So today we're gonna close out this service with giving you guys an opportunity to remember your baptism. It's the one thing that unites every single person that said yes to Jesus. You may have been baptized when you were a child. You may have been baptized when you were in high school or college or whenever it was. We just believe in one, and so it doesn't matter, right? If you're a baby or you're an adult, it still counts in God's eyes. So we got some bowls up front. I want you to feel free, if you want to, to come and just dip your hand in the water and be reminded that, that God's got a plan for your life, that that baptism means something. You took your faith public, and God honors that. We've got some little rocks in there, so if you wanna fish out one of those and keep it with you in your pocket for a while, just as a reminder, I wanna encourage you to do that. If you've never been baptized, I don't know of a better day to do that than today, right? It's Pentecost Sunday. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so we've got a couple of people that are gonna be baptized and they're gonna meet me over at the tank. But if you've never been baptized, you can get in and we'll dunk you or we'll just put a little water on your head. It's okay. It's not the amount of water. It's, it's the act itself. And if you've never been baptized, that is your next step. It's saying yes to Jesus and it's taking it public. And I would never do anything to embarrass anybody. But I want you to know that this is a great day to do that. So these guys are gonna lead us in one more song and you can just come, there's six stations. So spread out however you need to, spend as much time up here as you need to. Um, take a rock with you. And if you need to be baptized, you can meet me right down front. You come now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>